Okay, at this point, I don't even know what's worse. The fact that this guy proudly drained the blood of his 17-year-old son and transfused it with his own in an attempt to achieve eternal life, or the fact that this isn't even the weirdest thing he's done. Hi, I'm a random person on the internet. You're a random person on the internet. And together, we're here to talk about Blueprint Brian. Listen, laughing at rich people on the internet is an art form, okay? Especially here on YouTube. I mean, from the Kombucha King to the Bing Energy CEO to literally anything that Gwyneth Paltrow has ever done ever. So this is a 24 strain probiotic. Uh, no, this is making me. Some milk. I pretty much already knew what to expect going into this video, or so I thought. But look, I'm just gonna let you know up front, you have just clicked into a rabbit hole, and I hope you're ready for it because I know I wasn't. From selling a tech company for $800 million to now literally selling immortality to his followers, Brian Johnson has reached the kind of kookiness that can only really be achieved when the wealth gap divorces you from reality. On the one hand, his followers think of him as this mystical savior here to rescue them from the great beyond, but on the other hand, you can't go from a virtually unknown tech bro to being one of the most controversial people in the news overnight without making some enemies, and some health professionals seem to think he might just have more dollars than cents, if you catch my drift. Health and wellness is a lot like religion, and we said we're going to punch through the noise, we're going to look at data only. So yeah, what was supposed to just be a quick haha -ha video has basically turned into my Roman Empire, and I will never be satisfied until I drag at least one other person down into this rabbit hole with me. And it looks like you're just in time. So this deep dive is going to cover everything from his millionaire morning routine to the lesser known issues behind his blueprint protocol, aka the key to immortality, apparently. Blueprint is the best health protocol developed in history. Prove me wrong with your data. It's a story in two parts. So the first half, we'll look at where this guy came from. And in the second half, we'll see if it can offer even a hint of an explanation for how the heck he turned into uh, whatever this is. So as you can see, we do have a lot to talk about. But first, let's talk about me. I know you're here for the deep dives, but I also have a cult. I mean, a cool little side channel where I make casual commentary videos like these. No scripts, no schedule, just me and my phone whenever the heck I feel like it. Just like God intended. Actually, let's be real. God never intended for any of this. He left the chat ages ago and YouTube was a mistake, but I'm having fun. So if you just want to hear more of me talking, or if you want to see me talk about more subjects, then that channel is for you. If you're new, I already have a bunch of videos over there that you can watch. And if you're not new, I'm proud to announce that there are a bunch of videos on the way. So go ahead and find my side channel over in the description. Now, last thing before we get started. I don't think I've ever had a sponsor that's more fitting for the video topic before. I mean, today's video is kind of about health and fitness in a really weird black mirror-ish sort of way. But the point is, what could be healthier than a good old drink of water? And today's video is sponsored by none other than Air Up. Now, before Air Up, I kind of felt like the universe was pranking me, I'm not gonna lie. Like, if water is one of the most important parts of my diet, why is it also one of the most boring? I wanted flavor, but I didn't want to add a bunch of sugar and other additives. But then, I learned about scent-flavored water with Air Up. So here's how it works. First, I fill my Air Up bottle with good old drinking water, then I attach the straw and insert the special lid. Lastly, I pop on an Air Up flavor pod, and then the rest is history. Well, it's more so science than history. See, when you drink through the straw, an Air Up water bottle transports water and air into your mouth. And this air is scented via the flavor pod and your brain perceives it as flavor. It's called retronasal olfaction or just scent based taste, which is a bit less of a mouthful. Anyway, I just pop up the flavor pod to activate it and let the flavor begin. You can also deactivate it for an unflavored experience from the very same bottle. Air Up adds the fun to water. So click the link in the description to check out their flavors and get 10% off your order today. Now let's get into the video. So as you can guess, science is a pretty huge theme in the story, but in Interestingly enough, I'd say religion winds up being equally important, and if there's one thing that people in Brian's small hometown in Utah took seriously, it's religion. I was serving a mission for the Mormon church. Oh, so you're a Mormon. Uh, I was Mormon. You yes. are a Mormon. Yeah. See, we're not just talking about a go to church most Sundays type of situation here. We're talking about teens traveling to South America to do free Jesus promo because as Brian explains in this 2010 interview, when males turn 19 in the Mormon church, they are asked to go on a mission. And your mission, should you choose to accept it, it it's not really much of a choice when God's the one asking. It's strongly encouraged, but uh, borderline mandatory. I mean, it's right, along, right, right, right around there. And so Brian was off to Ecuador where he underwent what I can only describe as an eat, pray, love moment at best. Among extreme poverty and 
I saw how these people lived and the challenges they had, and they just didn't, they didn't have a shot at life. And it changed how I understood myself, the world, my ambitions, what I wanted to do. And I came home and I decided that I wanted to become an entrepreneur, retire by 30, and then spend the rest of my life trying to improve people's lives. I should become even more rich is certainly one way of responding to poverty. But you know, at the very least, it did sound like Brian's heart was in the right place. And he did his best to put his plan into action. Back in the States, he attended none other than Brigham Young University. Now, whereas college is usually a melting pot of differing perspectives, BYU is pretty much the academic capital of the Mormon world, as it's famously sponsored by the Mormon Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints themselves. Man, can you imagine if one day I just hit y'all with that? Today's video is sponsored by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. My sub count will drop faster than the market price of a Bitcoin ripoff. Anyway, Brigham Young University's Mormon affiliation means they have fun campus rules like no coffee allowed and men can't grow beards, even though Brigham Young himself literally looked like this, but we don't care, just do as you're told. So all this to say, Brian was in deep with the whole LDS church thing, but even at a young age, there was more to him than that. The entrepreneurial spirit he developed back in Ecuador began to blossom. I had this thought, I thought, wait a second, if I'm selling phones for him, why can't others sell phones for me? And I, I, <laughs> I left the sale, I ran home, and I spent almost two solid days figuring out how to become a wholesale provider of cell phone service. And I figured it out and I started a company, and now I I changed the commission structure, so now I was making $300 per activation. It turns out that starting a successful cell phone venture as a college student was just the beginning of Brian's business acumen, but he was gonna have to start thinking a bit bigger than Provo, Utah. After graduating from BYU with a bachelor's degree in international studies, Brian headed 1,500 miles east to pursue his master's degree at the prestigious Chicago Booth School of Business. Starting a whole new life in Chicago presented some growing pains, though. As we've seen, Brian was a pretty good businessman, but even then, he can't win them all. The cell phone company went remarkably well but it was not going to make me enough money to retire by 30. Of course, Brian just had to make even more money. That way he could save all the poor Ecuadorians all over the world. So next he co-founded Inquist, which was basically just like a mishmash between Vonage and Skype. It was 2001 and things were actually going really well at first with Inquist raising over $2 million in funding. But uh, then September rolled around and the Twin Towers kind of went up on a Tuesday. So needless to say, the venture funding industry froze a little bit, but Brian was not to be deterred. With cell phones, and internet phone calls not giving him the success he was looking for, he temporarily turned his efforts towards more low-tech endeavors. My brother and I got into a deal with a real estate venture. We funded about $70 million in mixed-use real estate development. However, this wasn't quite a happily ever after moment either, because after running into lower sales than expected, Brian and his bro wound up exiting the project after the first phase. There were $2 million in overruns, and the project was headed nowhere fast. Brian and his brother had just spent two years working on the project that netted nothing for them. After Inquist, this was now his second total failure in a row. Can I just say that I would love it if I could afford to fail to the tune of several million dollars? Like, how can you afford to make mistakes like that? I, I feel like for most people, that would just be a wrap. But for Brian, it was merely a footnote because he was finally, finally about to achieve that retire by 30 kind of business he was looking for the whole time. So when I started Braintree, I I had three main goals. One is that I wanted us to be the best payments provider in the world for developers. Two, that I wanted our employees to say it was the best company they'd ever worked for. And three, that our customers would write us love letters. Being the best payments provider in the world was a tall order, but Brian's new company, Braintree, definitely seemed to rise to the occasion. Just five years after its inception, Braintree scaled up to the point where it was able to purchase Venmo for $26 million. Now Braintree is processing not just standard credit card transactions, but mobile exchanges as well. But things only went up from there though, with Braintree raising even more money than they spent shortly thereafter. At this point, Braintree was being used by giants like Angry Birds, Airbnb, Uber, and it was a legitimate competitor to the likes of PayPal and Square. So much of a competitor, in fact, that PayPal was about to follow the age-old dodge, if you can't beat him, join him. But before that, we have to ask, how was Brian doing throughout all of this? Like, on the one hand, this was all very validating from a monetary standpoint. Obviously. My first venture when I was 21 was just short-sighted. We didn't understand what we were getting into. With the second in real estate, we made some misguided assumptions about others. But when I got into the credit card processing, I finally felt like I had complete control over determining whether it succeeded or failed. It was the first time in my entrepreneurship career where my effort directly controlled the outcome. It felt really good. And this is all well and good, but there was just one small problem. 
Money can't buy happiness. I mean, actually, to be fair, money absolutely can contribute to your happiness, especially when you're starting off without a lot of it. But when you're playing with Monopoly money and you have been doing so for several years, like Brian at this point, there are going to be diminishing returns in the happiness department. And despite all of this material wealth, Brian was dealing with the kinds of problems that money can't really fix. I was building Braintree and, uh, you know, I had challenges at home with my significant other and I had kids who weren't sleeping. I was sleeping myself, working 24 seven, having companies break and like all the pressure. And it just drove me into the ground to a point that I just, I was just delirious. I mean, I was, I was broke. As you can see, Braintree was thriving, but unfortunately, Brian was not. While it was nice that the company was doing well, Brian was still coming off the back of a string of really large scale business failures. So how did he know that Braintree wouldn't wind up in the same boat overnight, basically? Couple that with the issues at home and all of this stress understandably started impacting his mental health in a really serious way, resulting in some pretty dark thoughts. But even worse, this was complicated by the fact that he didn't even feel like he was allowed to have these dark thoughts because of his religious upbringing. If you took your life, you would, you're not behaving in a way that this belief system in, you know, rewards you. And so I was trapped in existence. And it was the worst feeling in the entire world because I had no out. But not only that, I had kids. And so I had to, you know, like, I felt responsible for being a father. Yeah, it was some pretty heavy stuff, as you can see. But thankfully, that's not where the story ended. Brian actually wound up getting out of one of the lowest points of his life by visiting one of the highest points on the planet, all the way in Africa. At the peak of a particularly strenuous climbing expedition to scale Mount Kilimanjaro, Brian had a bit of an epiphany. If he could tackle a literal mountain, he could probably tackle anything. I made it to the top and I uh, just broke down and cried. And it was like, uh, uh, it was, the mountain was my depression. It was my marriage. Um, it was my belief system. And, um, I went home and I was changed. So back in the States, Brian got to work, breaking up with everyone from his ex-wife to Mormon Jesus. And this kind of thing couldn't have been easy, but it was clearly for the best. I sold my company shortly after Braintree. I got a divorce. I left my religion. And this turned out to be a net positive for both Brian's happiness and his bank account, if we're being honest. Remember PayPal? They're the ones who took Braintree off of Brian's hands for an eye-watering $800 million. Braintree and Venmo are alive and well to this day, and Brian got to keep an undisclosed amount of $800 million and none of the stress that came with building it. So if I found myself in this position, I I'm just gonna be honest, you would never see me again, okay? I like society? Not for me anymore. I've evolved past the need for that. I would just go live in a forest mansion like a Twilight Vampire. But now that Brian finally had enough money to retire and pursue his goal of, you know, saving the human race, let's just say things were about to get kind of weird. So even though Brian stepped back from the church all those years ago, it wasn't exactly a clean cut. Like, long, complex relationships rarely are. As he describes in 2015, he didn't just turn his back on the church overnight. I mean, since I've, I've separated from the church, I uh -huh. mean, I do have different perspectives and lenses than I did before. Right. And I can understand why people maintain certain viewpoints. And it's not easy to let go of something that's been a part of you for your entire life. Even after that interview, you could still find them attending the odd Mormon conference, like this one in 2018. I'm happy to introduce a special guest speaker at the conference, Brian Johnson. He wasn't just an attendee either, he was a featured speaker, but the weirdest thing is that his featured speech has been completely scrubbed from the internet. Like almost every other speaker at this event, including the other keynote speakers, all of their talks were streamed live and they're still publicly available online. And it definitely seems like that was supposed to be the case for Brian as well. Like look how it's presented live. Please join me in welcoming Brian Johnson. But then it just, stops like it might seem like the live stream was ended right there but it's also possible that his part was cut out from the stream after the fact and if you're wondering why that would have happened well I think it's because Brian was low-key dragging them Braintree founder opposes latter-day saint mormonism an arena of faithful Latter-day Saint Mormonism. So even though the actual recording of Brian's talk at this conference has been deleted, like most things on the internet, you can't get rid of it all the way. And from this surviving article which details some of the things he said there, it seems pretty clear that he was kind of against Mormonism, but like, 
still at a Mormonism conference? I don't know. There was a lot going on there. You have a lot of doubts about the Mormon church. You don't think it's true, but you don't dare tell anybody, Johnson said. It's going to affect your family's relationships, so you keep it a secret. And I want you to know that as you grow older, you are not in the minority. You are in the majority. You will find that most people have deep reservations. So it seems like Brian's whole speech was presented as a sort of retrospective letter to his 24-year-old self, where he admits that not only did he always harbor doubts about the LDS religion, but that he believes probably this applies to most Mormons, but they just don't question things too strongly because they're kind of scared of the answers. The worst thing in the world that could happen is someone demonstrates to you that the Mormon church is not true. Johnson continues to tell his younger self, because if the Mormon church is not true, it's terrifying. So if it wasn't enough to basically renounce your religion and then low-key imply that almost everyone else is faking theirs, he then goes on to criticize Mormonism itself, saying that Mormons view life as a single-player sport. While you play a single-player sport, I am playing a multi-billion dollar sport, Johnson said. I have to play with a few billion people on Earth. So, um... Yeah, I think it's safe to assume that Mormon folks are probably a little bit blindsided by this one. Overall, it's pretty clear to me at least why Brian's talk at this conference most likely no longer exists on the internet. Like, it was kind of scandalous. It's got that sort of bordering on blasphemy energy. And while I do try to maintain that energy in my personal life just to keep things interesting, I don't think it's very consistent with the branding of a religious organization. So I could see why it disappeared. And you know, I bring up the whole Mormon conference for two reasons. One, to show that in the years following the $800 million sale of Braintree, Brian appeared to be very conflicted about where exactly he stood with Mormonism. And frankly, it kind of makes sense. Like, the Church of Latter-day Saints was literally all he knew for his whole life, so moving on was kind of just bumpy and messy and a little bit prickly, and contradictory feelings lead to contradictory actions, like talking down Mormonism to a room full of Mormons at the conference that they invited you to. But the other huge reason I bring up the conference is that not only was he closing the chapter on one part of his life, but he had already started writing a new one, and this new chapter was transhumanism. The belief or theory that the human race can evolve beyond its current physical and mental limitations, especially by means of science and technology. Now, even though it sounds like the plot of a Marvel movie, I actually don't think transhumanism as a concept is really all that strange, especially since we already use science and technology to do way more than we used to as a species, even just compared to a few centuries ago. So honestly, between the unfathomable amounts of money, the general desire to help humanity, and now a whole lot of new free time, it kind of just makes sense that Brian Johnson would wind up turning his attention to the wide world of transhumanism. Humanism. It's easy to assume that something as forward-looking as transhumanism might be in direct conflict with something as traditional as Brian's Mormon upbringing, and as we saw from the conference in many ways, that conflict was definitely there. But what I didn't mention was that that conference was actually a transhumanism conference in and of itself. But like, for Mormons. It was none other than the 2018 annual meeting of the Mormon Transhumanist Association. And I know, I know, that might sound overly specific to the point where I just made it up, but look, you can see the sign right behind the guy who introduced Brian as a featured speaker. Now, to be clear, the Mormon Transhumanist Association is a very fringe group. I mean, they barely have a thousand members for crying out loud, compared to the literal 17 million Mormons in the world today. So clearly, there is a very, very small overlap between Mormons and transhumanists but trust me, Brian was going to find it. Anything to hold on to that religion versus science balance that he had in his life. But as the years continued to pass, that balance started to change until one day the science kind of just took over. But in a completely nonsensical fashion, the more he leaned into science and away from religion, the more he started to sound completely out of touch with reality. See, it wasn't always that way. In fact, I think Brian's initial transhumanist efforts were decidedly not weird. The year after Braintree was sold to PayPal, Brian launches OS Fund, which finally financially supports companies that are making scientific advancements in medicine and biology. He put over a hundred million dollars into OS Fund, but he was just getting started. Next, he founded Kernel, a company focused on furthering the research and development of brain interface technology. I do feel tremendous personal motivation in building Kernel because I suffered so deeply in my challenges of the, of the mind. It wasn't all just talk either. In a 2020 documentary called I Am Human, we see this newer technology being used to help people with Parkinson's, blindness, paralysis, like it's some pretty impressive stuff. Brian's actually in this documentary and he's fairly optimistic about the future of humanity. The key to everything we want is to open up and consider this new set of possibilities that we've never considered before. But I feel like Brian was mayhaps 
too optimistic about all of this. Like so much so that in a 2018 update on his website, he says, for the past year, I've been writing a plan for humanity. Yes, seriously, because I'm consumed with the fate of our collective future. I wrote over 82 drafts of this monster. I hope you'll read it and I would enjoy hearing your reactions. But honestly, I'm not sure if he would enjoy hearing my reaction because I was mostly confused. I went ahead and read the 82nd draft of his plan for humanity and yeah, there's some weird stuff in there. I don't go to pools. I don't drink margaritas. Somehow, here I am, sitting at a pool with a margarita in hand, editing my 82nd draft of a plan for the future of the human race. Well, gee, thank you for your sacrifice, Brian. Anyway, if I had to sum up his plan, it's basically just that we should self-reflect, seek evolution, incentivize progress, accept change, fund hard science, solve big problems, and up update our beliefs over time. And I legitimately agree with every single point. But the thing is, he's kind of presenting this information as if it's some crazy new paradigm shift that he's invented on the spot. These are ideas that consume me. I can't stop thinking about them, dreaming about them. I burn inside with an ambition that feels out of place in the early 21st century. Like this is science, not a Jane Austen novel. You're not unlike other girls just because you support scientific progress. And so in the absence of seeing any viable plans for the future of the human race, I've decided to write one. Love it, hate it, or just find me crazy. It's a place to start. Well, I for one am very happy that Brian has chosen to save us by taking 82 drafts to write the words, science is good. Like this is the kind of divorce from reality vibe I was mentioning earlier. And don't get me wrong, I support the message, but sir, this is a Wendy's. But ultimately, the focus was mostly on the science, so as long as Brian's pretentiousness never gets to a point where it starts to overshadow his intentions, I'm sure everything will be just fine. I'm sure that's not exactly what's going to happen in the remainder of this video. Anyway, Brian's transhumanism era was kind of like the opposite of his string of unsuccessful business encounters after his college days. Like at this point, Brian was making back-to-back -back impacts in the world of science and technology and legitimately improving people's lives in the process. And sure, his presentation was kind of, um self-important at times, but if there's one thing that several hundred million dollars are going to do, it's going to make you sound a bit out of touch. But overall, I would still describe Brian's impact at this point as a net positive. He just kept doing what he was doing and kind of just stayed behind the scenes and yeah, this is the part where everyone's supposed to live happily ever after and the video is supposed to be over. But I I think we both know that things are about to devolve into utter insanity instead. See, this whole time, Brian's goals for humanity were mostly focused on other people, but then he started shifting his attention inwards. And that is where he absolutely and utterly lost the plot. All right, so before we get into part two, I've actually been advised to start this next part off with a medical disclaimer. So let's just get that out of the way first. Disclaimer. I'm dumb as hell. Do I look like a medical doctor to you? If you interpret even a single thing that I say in this video as medical advice, I'm going to sue you, okay? Okay, so now that we're clear on that, back to Brian. Up until this point, I think I would have actually described him as being a pretty behind the scenes kind of guy. Like, yeah, he's a super rich CEO, but everything we've seen so far, I've had to source from like small podcasts or super niche articles, and it didn't really seem like Brian had much interest in being a public figure. In fact, he kind of just disappeared for a while there, and I didn't really find much about him at all until he spontaneously resurfaced earlier this year. And oh my God, what happened? So tech bro Brian, who we know and love, or at the very least appreciate, has now been replaced by Blueprint Brian. And Blueprint Brian is, for lack of a subtler word, insane. Like, he's for real, honest to God, so scary. My name is Brian Johnson. I am a professional rejuvenation athlete. I left my mother's womb 45 years ago. So if you're wondering what a professional rejuvenation athlete is, um, don't worry, we all are because Brian just made that up. But here's what a typical day looks like for said rejuvenation athlete. First, you use a light therapy lamp that mimics sunlight to reset your circadian rhythm. Then you apply not one, not two, but seven anti-sun damage skin creams, dye your hair with the gray hair reversal concoction, which you pretend is not hair dye, pop a few pills to boost your iron and vitamin C, stimulate your collagen with a light laser mask, which is different from your light therapy lamp, vibrate the side of your nose with a device that stimulates the nerve that creates tears in your eyes, because I'm sure you're not crying enough already at this point, pop like 60 more pills to go with your spermidine, amino complex, creatine, collagen, peptide, cocoa, flavanol, and cinnamon smoothie. Wow, that's an interesting taste. I gotta say, it doesn't taste amazing. You know, it's not like something I'd I'd find in a, a like a juice bar or something. Right. There's a little bit of a 
aftertaste to it that's not not fantastic next up are your special grip strength improvement exercises followed by an hour of normal exercises potentially followed by a tri-weekly hit workout with the occasional oxygen tracking mask then you consume your vegan steamed vegetables and lentils for breakfast which you call first meal instead of breakfast i eat exactly 1977 calories a day i eat over 70 pounds of vegetables a month and then you use your tri-weekly infrared light therapy lamp which is actually different from both your light laser mask and your normal light therapy lamp you execute the remainder of your predetermined activities for the day and then you wear your blue light blocking glasses for two hours straight before we're going to sleep at 8 30 in the evening every single night and you know i think brian himself sums up his daily routine the best my entire life is basically structured with uh we've referenced over 2,000 scientific publications and over 100 protocols it's entirely based upon evidence and data and before you say that this all sounds like an absolutely miserable way to live your life just remember i have never in my entire life been happier more fulfilled or had a more expanded consciousness uh sure brian so why 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 would anyone subject themselves to any of this well as the time magazine profile which details brian's daily antics tells us brian johnson thinks he can live forever like no seriously but he's not just chasing eternal life he's also offering it for free question mark and it all revolves around the blueprint protocol so blueprint is brian's newest company and it's basically a research project slash guidebook for how to achieve or at least approach brian's exact lifestyle it's got everything from vegan recipes so you can copy his diet to affiliate links and promo codes where you can buy the same products that he uses like i can only really describe blueprint and brian's whole new aesthetic as sort of being gwyneth paltrow's goop but on steroids gwyneth wants you to be well allegedly but brian wants you to be here forever and let me tell you this, media outlets started eating this up. It wasn't just the aforementioned Time Magazine profile. This man was getting extensive coverage. Rolling Stone, The Guardian, Bloomberg, a Bloomberg video interview, a Fortune video interview, and Fortune articles. So many Fortune articles. I counted one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 different Fortune articles about Brian Johnson. And then I just gave up counting. You would honestly think that this man solved world hunger the way these outlets were obsessing over him. I'm not a biohacker. I'm not an optimization person. I'm an explorer about the future of being human. Pretty much overnight, Brian went from relative unknown to mainstream media darling. And while the tone of these articles did range from hype to hesitation, they were all serving as some really great free promo for Brian, Blueprint, and his goal of not just living forever, but reversing his biological age. My objective here is to prove that we can dramatically slow the speed of aging and even reverse it. See, as Bloomberg tells us, he wants to have the brain, heart, lungs, liver, kidneys, tendons, teeth, skin, hair, bladder, genitals, and rectum of an 18 year old. I shouldn't even have to say this, but there were a couple words in there that really shouldn't have been used in the same sentence. But yeah, Brian Johnson is absolutely obsessed with this whole biological age thing. We've slowed my speed of aging by the equivalent of 31 years. So that means I now accumulate aging damage slower than the average 10 year old. That's how fast damage my body's accumulating. Um, I have a VO2 max, my body's ability to use uh, oxygen on the par in the top 1.5% of 18 year olds. It's like every other word out of his mouth is a number, half his age. And like, I'm about to show my age here, but it literally reminds me of the Wii Fitness age from Wii Sports. Like, does anybody remember that? Imagine spending $2 million a year on this daily routine when you can just get the same experience from a 2006 video game. But you know, while it is pretty weird and it's fun to make jokes about it, I think a lot of the things Brian is promoting with Blueprint are pretty sound. Like encouraging people to get a good night's sleep and discouraging hustle culture are good things, especially compared to your everyday Joe millionaires who try to flex their morning routines. What time do you go to bed? Monday through Friday, I'm good with four or five hours of sleep. So often it's 11 or midnight. Like at the very least, at least what Brian's doing is actually healthy, mostly. Right? Honestly, I kind of wish the answer was yes, because if it was, then despite all this being a bit silly, there really wouldn't be anything wrong with it at all. But unfortunately, Brian's pursuit of eternal life has led him into some practices that I can only really describe as extreme. And that's putting it nicely. No matter which way you look at it, Brian Johnson is doing some seriously unhealthy things. In fact, if we rewind a bit, I actually already mentioned one of them. Do you remember the one part of his daily routine that he did more than anything else? Not the multiple therapy lamps or the back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back workout sessions. I kind of breezed over this, but I mentioned him popping vitamin pills more than once throughout the day, including over 60 pills to go with his horrible aftertaste smoothies. And while I do have a penchant for exaggeration because it would be dull 
pill and not two. Yeah, I was being dead serious. How many pills will you take in one day? Currently 111. Wow. And you take 60 of them in the morning? That's right. Wow. Now, as previously mentioned, I don't have a medical degree, but I do have a brain. And I'm pretty sure it would start screaming if I knocked back over 100 supplement pills every single day. If there's any medical professionals out there who want to elaborate or set the record straight, please do, because this sounds like the setup of a chubby emo video. Surely there are less extreme methods of getting your daily nutrients, because this... <laughs> Those are all the pills you take in one day. That's right. This is ridiculous. Also, this is a very naive and uninformed question, but it's coming from the heart. If you're constantly experiencing the effects of over 100 pills, then how do you actually know which ones are working and which ones are just placebos? Anyway, pills aren't the only thing that Brian's excessively subjecting his body to. How about uh, needles? In his Rolling Stone profile, Brian says, over the past week alone, past seven days, I've probably been stuck by a needle 60 times. Again, I would classify this as extreme. I know that there really are some people under intense medical supervision that may require this many procedures or pills or things like this but doing so voluntarily while positioning yourself as a role model for general health and fitness is kind of disturbing to me but you know what don't take my word for it like seriously don't instead let's just listen to some actual medical professional see part of brian's whole claim to fame is that blueprint is supposed to be under constant expert supervision as brian himself puts it in a book that we'll explore later the blueprint team is made up of scientists doctors and researchers all have an explorer's mindset. Had they been born in the 1800s, they would be tinkering with electricity or searching for gold in the California hills. If they had lived in the 1500s, they would have started the Renaissance. If they had existed during the Ice Age, they would be the ones crossing. Okay, I think we get it. So yeah, anyway, kind of a bold claim there. But unlike many of the articles written about him, Time Magazine actually bothered to check with doctors who are not on Brian's payroll. And um, let's just say they weren't quite impressed. Brian, ever the conference enthusiast, attended this year's annual retreat for the Academy for Health and Lifespan Research. Also in attendance was one Dr. Nir Barzilai, aka the director of the Albert Einstein College of Medicine's Institute for Aging Research. So, you know, probably knows a thing or two about aging. But when he and Brian ran into each other, it sounds like first impressions were a little less than favorable. He looked sick. He was pale. I don't know what he did with his face, Dr. Barzilai says, adding that he was alarmed by Johnson's lack of fat, which plays an important role in the body. All these MDs, we kind of agreed that he didn't look so great. I will say this, Brian does look kind of scary. Like, objectively, he looks like he's in good shape, kind of, but in the same way that a Twilight vampire is in good shape, if you know what I mean. But in Dr. Barzilai's opinion, the issues with Brian's blueprint are a bit more than just skin deep. Barzilai also has serious reservations about Johnson taking so many supplements and treatments at once, warning that all of the different pills could interact with one another in dangerous ways. What he's doing hasn't proven to be safe because some of the treatments he's taking are actually antagonizing to each other. He says, adding that doctors normally research the effects of one drug at a time rather than the cumulative effects of more than 100 pills at once. And Dr. Barzilai is not the only one who thinks that Brian's research is ineffective either. Dr. Eric Verdon, the CEO of the Buck Institute for Research on Aging, weighed in as well. Verdon isn't just skeptical of Johnson's claims that he can achieve immortality. He's skeptical of his claims of age reversal altogether. He professes to make everything transparent, but as a scientist, it's really impossible to understand the tools he's using to assess his age, Verdon says, adding that the Buck Institute reached out to Johnson to collaborate on some research but never heard back. Johnson's lack of interest in collaboration with independent scientists made Dr. Verdon even more skeptical. I think if he wants to convince all of us that what he's doing is valid, then he's going to have to accept being challenged by colleagues. So yeah, it's starting to seem like Brian's whole shtick doesn't hold up very well under scrutiny from people who actually know what they're doing. In fact, Dr. Barzilai was even more straightforward in his rejection of Blueprint and its current state. Even if it works for him, how do you know it works for you, Barzilai says. Blueprint Print, he adds, is not an experiment that we accept as scientists or doctors. Honestly, at the end of the day, the only doctors I could find that actually vouched for Brian were the ones he hired himself. And it's just really convenient that the medical opinions who support what he's doing just happen to come from the people he's employing. And that lack of credibility in Brian's age reversal claims that Dr. Verdon pointed out seems to be pretty universally criticized by anybody who knows what to look for. Like scientist Dr. Andrew Steele shows us that honestly, some of these claims aren't even as important 
impressive as they sound in the first place. In fact, some of these quote unquote age reversals might have just come straight from a pill bottle. Once you understand how he did it, it's not quite so impressive anymore. He takes a supplement called NMN, which is thought to boost your NAD levels. So this does feel a little bit like cheating. If you find something that's got high levels in young people and levels that then decrease with age, then by taking supplements of that thing, you can effectively decrease your biological age. Dr. Steele also goes on in that video to point out that some of the things Brian mentioned may not even be related to biological age in the first place, at least not in a way that's currently supported by science. So Brian's putting all of this effort into trying to have the body of an 18 year old inside and out, but it's not even really clear that he's hitting that goal in a meaningful way. And you know, once again, another naive question coming from the guy without a medical degree, but instead of having the X of an 18 year old or the Y of a 10 year old, why can't you just strive to be the healthiest 45 year old that you could possibly be? Like in one of the 15,000 fortune articles about Brian's blueprint, Dr. Steele says you just can't exercise your way to living to 100, let alone the world record breaking 122 or something like that. No amount of diet or exercise is going to get you that magical combination of genes. Anyway, I've quoted like three different people with PhDs at this point. That way I can understand why some of Brian's stuff is bad news in an informed and competent way. But but you don't need a doctor to tell you why this next part is bad. In Brian's Bloomberg profile, the interviewer brings up a really disturbing interaction that she had. In September, shortly before I walked up to his door in Venice, California for dinner, he texted to warn me that he just had some fat injected into his face and seemed to be suffering from an allergic reaction to the excruciating procedure. As a result, he said, he might look a little weird. He was not wrong. When he opened the door, I could barely recognize him. His face was so puffed up, it looked like he'd spent the afternoon chugging bee venom. Now, having an allergic reaction to a procedure is scary enough, but the procedure itself is absolutely bizarre. He's injecting someone else's fat into his face, not just as fillers, but with the hope that it will actually start producing the fat cells of a younger person. It will take a few months for the fat scaffold to build, but then as I regenerate, it will actually create fat on its own. If I do an MRI or multispectral imaging, then hopefully it will show that I'm identical to an 18 year old again. Usually the early adopters of this procedure harvest the fat from other parts of a patient's body, but Johnson, who doesn't have the fat to spare, received his from an undisclosed donor. Having an allergic reaction to having someone else's fat injected into your face is literally insane. Like I absolutely don't need an expert to point out how dangerous that is. Complications can arise even in mandatory surgeries, but the fact that this is happening because you're out here freestyling during an already experimental cosmetic procedure is unreal. And aside from the fact that he got lucky that this complication wasn't nearly as serious as they can be, the procedure itself is just sick to me. Like how, how is this health and longevity? Why can't your health exist without the use of somebody else's body? Is this where we're at now with millionaires? We're just walking body parts for them. Like we're not talking about life saving things here like kidney transplants and helpful blood transfusions. Taking someone else's fat so you can have your baby face back is some serious black mirror energy. And speaking of dystopia and blood transfusions, the botched face experiment wasn't even the only time Brian's health goals involved taking matter from someone else's body. But this time it was coming from his own offspring. Yeah, another article from, you guessed it, Fortune Magazine details how Brian's 17 year old son had a full liter of blood removed. Brian and his father did the same thing and then the three of them switched blood with each other in what Brian calls the world's first multi-generational plasma exchange. Yeah, I wonder why this was a first and nobody has done this before literally ever. The FDA advises against people infusing young blood because there's no compelling clinical evidence on its efficacy. Yet yeah, Johnson's medical team approved the procedure as a possible treatment for cognitive decline. So we're straight up just ignoring medical advice from the FDA and absorbing the blood of our literal children instead. I, I guess Brian really was the Twilight Vampire all along. And if you hate being 45 so much, why did you just unnecessarily inject a bunch of your decades old blood into a minor just for the slight chance that it could reduce your biological age? Well, it was completely pointless because Brian himself later admitted that there were no real benefits. If only there was some sort of administration I mentioned like 30 seconds ago that had already established there was no evidence for this ever working. Did you think your team of pocket doctors was going to outscience the FDA? And while Brian's son did consent to this, I really don't think that makes me feel any better. Like between this and the undisclosed donor providing his face fat injections, it's it's setting a really disturbing precedent, especially when you consider the coercive power of money. As if
if there were not already enough ways for the uber wealthy to profit from us, now not even our blood or fat cells are safe. This is absolutely the plot of a horror movie, but we're living it right now. A24, more like 2024. And I think the most offensive thing is that despite all of this, Brian still seems completely miserable, like you're chasing something that's not even desirable. Time Magazine makes it really clear. Johnson says his lifestyle makes it very difficult for him to date, rattling off what he calls the 10 reasons why women will literally hate me. The reasons include eating dinner at 11.30 a.m., no sunny vacations, bed at 8.30 p.m., no small talk, always sleeping alone, and of course, they're not my number one priority. No sunny vacation? You are never, and I mean never, going to convince me that this and that and a thousand pills are the actions of someone who is the happiest they've ever been in their life. Like full stop, imagine chasing something that you spend every single millisecond getting further away from. Imagine having to come up with reasons why dyeing your hair and getting dangerous fillers are actually health benefits and not cosmetic procedures. Imagine being so scared of dying that you have effectively stopped living your own life. I say this with absolutely no exaggeration, I am more scared of turning into whatever that is is in my middle age than I am of death itself. But like, I'm also not a medical doctor, so who knows? Like I said, literally everything I'm saying right now could be wrong. Anyway, now it's time to shift this discussion back into my field of expertise, aka being weird online. Remember that trademark pretentiousness that was creeping into Brian's worldview even as far back as his saving humanity with the poolside margarita era, or even further back when he decided he would rescue all the poor people of Ecuador? Well, I don't know if it was the newfound fame or a baffling marketing strategy or if the money just enabled him a bit too much, but Brian's ego has reached critical mass. Like he's not just trying to create a blueprint, he's trying to create an entire way of life called zeroism. It started off fairly normally with this article that he wrote back in 2021, in which he, in true Brian Johnson fashion, takes 1700 words to basically just say think outside the box, but since then he scaled it up so far that he's now actually calling himself zero. My name is indeed zero to many. As if literally anyone calls him that. Stop trying to make zero happen. But the craziest thing is it actually is happening. Some people are calling him this. Like, he is building this weird fringe following of people who share his beliefs. And of course, it's happening on Elon Musk's Twitter. Twitter was bad before Elon Musk, but I just like saying Elon Musk's Twitter. It just it makes it sound even worse. In addition to the zero moniker, he's now adopted this don't die slogan, which he's slapping on everything from t-shirts to his website. And now he's even writing a book about it. The book I mentioned earlier, which we'll get to in a second, like the man is building an entire aesthetic around his obsession with not dying. Check out the bio for his book. Zero was the first human to surpass 500 years of age, dying in the year 2478, hit by Earth's last bus in operation. He fathered millions of biological and digital offspring, now living in far reaches of the galaxy. Best known for Zeroism and inventing resurrection technology, Undie, Zero famously raised his enemies from the dead so he could tell them that he had outlived them. If you told me at the beginning of this video that I would be reading self-written sci-fi fanfiction about this man having a million space children, I feel like I would have just stopped recording then and there. Who is going to tell this man that he is not the main character of the human race? Like, I just straight up refuse to take part in this shonen anime where Brian gets to live forever and we're all just mad haters. I'm gonna live forever without following Brian's blueprint just to shut him up. But don't worry, because we haven't even reached peak Twitter nonsense yet. See, the constant coverage of Brian's extreme lifestyle resulted in a bunch of people making light of the situation. And honestly, some of it was pretty funny. Greg Breakfast is a bowl of supplements and a cold glass of blood transfusion. Then I wear the skin of a child prodigy and relearn the concept of object permanence. But then Brian tried to do the thing where the person in question joins the meme and then the whole thing just falls apart. So now we've got Brian mocking people, mocking Brian. And so now we're stuck with masterpieces of prose like this. Now listen here, shorty. The girth of my protocol will have your joystick at full salute and ready to gear shift like a toy soldier. If I had to read that with my own two eyes, so did you. But he's also trying to simultaneously be in on the joke and above it at the same time, saying there's a lot of social pressure to hate on me, making light of the hate and making fun of myself lessens that risk, as it gives people who do support these new ideas permission to make fun of me too, creating a safe combo of support and distance. No, actually, you're just kind of whack and it's not that deep. Like, you're LARPing as Dracula, people think it's funny, and that's about it. There's no social pressure here. But yeah, while his new persona and his misapplied or incredibly outdated memes aren't really that serious, the one part of his online stick that I just... 
I find it difficult to get past is that he's seriously leaned into these blood boy allegations. I guess this is part of his make fun of myself before they do strat, but it honestly just skeeves me out. Some clarification needed. One, I've not had plastic surgery. Yeah, because the fat you injected into your face was purely for health reasons. Two, I don't drink blood. Three, the dungeon where I keep my blood boy son is eight by eight feet, not four by four. Like, dude, come on now. This is the kind of joke that works when you're not guilty of the thing that people are saying. But you quite literally have a blood boy son. I'm throwing a surprise birthday party for my blood boy son. He's turning 18. The fact that you're not desperately trying to hide the fact that he's 18 is crazy. Like, I already thought the blood boy thing was weird when I first heard about it secondhand, but when I then found out that he was literally a minor at the time, what is going on here? And like, he just won't shut up about it either. Looks like I messed up and should have sewn my blood boy son into me. Gene therapy, me, my personal blood boy. This is just such a lighthearted tone to take over something so very weird that it comes across as being a bit unhinged. And honestly, just imagine your dad constantly memeing on Twitter about using you for your blood. I don't want to imagine. But anyway, furthering his vampire agenda and building a cult while role-playing as his own original character aren't the only things he spends his time doing on Twitter. Like, of course, what would the point of a cult following be if you can't sell them anything? Exciting news, friends. Blueprint Extra Virgin Olive Oil is now available. The first step in scaling accessibility. Yeah, I'm not really sure what's accessible about paying $70 for two bottles of olive oil. This is almost twice as expensive as the olive oil you can get from your local grocery store. Like, I looked. I saw a bottle going for about 70 cents an ounce, and I know Brian's is supposedly premium, so I contrasted it against the most stunningly overpriced bottle I could find at my store, and that one was going for a dollar an ounce, which is ridiculous, but Brian's is going for a dollar thirty. And what, pray tell, do you do with this laughably overpriced olive oil? Well, according to Brian's blueprint, you just knock back a few tablespoons, no questions asked. Now, I didn't even want to give this man money as a joke, because I'm worried he's just going to turn around and use it to steal my face fat, but I did go ahead and buy the aforementioned stunningly overpriced bottle from my local grocery store. And you know what? I had an intrusive thought. I knocked back a tablespoon spoon of extra virgin olive oil for Brian, and I gotta say, it doesn't taste amazing. Definitely not like something I'd find in a juice bar. There is, in fact, an aftertaste to it that is not fantastic. But, you know, I do want to outlive this guy, so... Just kidding, this is just water for my air up water bottle. There is definitely a joke in here somewhere about Brian just being a snake oil salesman, but even the snakes were like, nah, so now it's just olive oil. But what do you know? He already beat me to it. Always the future proof for that, Brian. Jesus fed bread and wine for an afterlife without guarantee. I feed you olive oil for continued life and money back guarantee. Actually, you know what? Speaking of Jesus, Let's talk about this massive messiah complex for a minute, because I, for one, find it fascinating. First of all, let's be real. Brian isn't really doing anything impressive with Blueprint at all. Like, he himself admits in his Rolling Stone interview that you can, in fact, get the majority of the benefits Blueprint provides just from sleep, exercise, and avoiding bad habits. The man is paying $2 million a year to prove that there are benefits to the same basic health advice that we all learned as literal preschoolers. Like, truly, at his heart, Brian Johnson is just an overly complicated fitness influencer who sells all of oil merch instead of hoodies, but despite this, my man is literally acting like some kind of martyr for humanity. Blueprint may seem like it's about diet, sleep, and health. It's not. It's about figuring out how we survive as a species. And because of this attitude he's adopted, Brian's small but very vocal following literally acts like he's longevity Jesus, just here to save them all from aging. If he really wanted to benefit humanity, something tells me that that $2 million in research would be a bit more useful spread across multiple subjects as opposed to all going to Brian. But then again, experts are unanimously telling us that Brian isn't handling the research properly anyway, so truly, what is the point? Like. Who is this helping? Not even Brian at this point. The man has just turned his entire life into a bad science experiment, and he wants us to believe that it is for our benefit. Jesus fed bread and alcohol, impairing and aging. I will feed you nutrients that awake and create life. And it's not just lighthearted tweets like that either. Brian literally has Twitter beef with Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I am serious about challenging the authority and status of Jesus Christ. It's 2000 year old technology. Philosophies must be equal to the technological abilities of their time or they create drag for evolutionary advance. Okay, the funniest thing is, 
I actually think he's completely correct here, but if you honestly think I'm about to accept blueprint Jesus into my heart as a replacement for normal Jesus, you got me messed up. And that's what this entire thing sort of feels like under the surface, some sort of replacement for religion. My man soured on Mormonism, turned himself into the new messiah, and basically wrote his own blueprint bible. Like he went from being understanding towards people who may hold other religious beliefs to straight up saying revolt against any religion, philosophy, or cultural norm embracing death. But the issue is this is pretty much all religions and all philosophies and all cultural norms for all of human history because the one thing we have always had to grapple with and that we have all had in common is that we are all going to die just embrace it like what is what's wrong with dying i don't even really think it's that depressing that we're all gonna die this place low-key sucks who wants to be here forever not me we show up ball out and pack it up. I love the energy of considering alternatives and I support the advancement of science that can change the way we think about the human lifespan, but clearly we're not there yet and we have to deal with that. 100 pills a day and assimilating the blood of the youth are not ways of dealing with it. And at that point, you're coping even harder than religion. Like between the increase in zealousness, the ever inflating self-importance and this intolerance for differing approaches to life, Brian Johnson has literally made blueprint his new religion. Take a bow, Brian. But honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if at this point he wants us to bow to him. As I was wrapping up the initial research for this video, I saw that Brian had posted an advanced copy of the book he was working on to Twitter. That book, of course, was Don't Die by Zero. And I was like, you know what? Why not? So I cracked it open, saw that it was almost 60,000 words and immediately closed that tab. Respectfully, I ain't even trying to read all that. But you know, just to do my due diligence, I did wind up reading the first part, which was actually like a solid 60 pages, just in case it wound up changing my perspective on Brian. And honestly, it really didn't. <laughs> like it absolutely did not. The book is just Brian personified, quite literally. The whole thing takes place as a conversation between different characters that represent the different aspects of his personality. With subtle yet deep character names like self-critical and six authority it's all very writing a letter to my 24 year old self never changed brian and you know he's doing all the brian things right like as always the book is way too self-referential he kept using a word that i had never seen before and so i looked it up only to find out that it's a word he made up in like 2018 he's got a bunch of quotes throughout the book some of which are pulled straight from his own twitter which at that point just throw in a couple of rupee cow drawings and you've got yourself pills and honey and as for the writing itself it's just kind of of dramatic. When he emphasized certain words, access, society, he would stop walking as if the force of the thoughts was so great they impeded his movements. And this would be all well and good if said forceful thoughts were actually insightful or even interesting, but instead we just get things like this. Perhaps because not everybody has the need, means, or interest in solving the world, it's a luxurious contemplation exercise, the Prada stamp for the catalog of thought exercises. Mostly people spend their time solving the needs of their day their week or their month like yeah no kidding brian we don't all have the time or resources to care this much about literally anything as with all things brian the book is just not that deep like it, it wants to be an autobiography but it's not really it's sort of an analogy but it's not necessarily a good one and then it's got some parts that are just not good at all i guess what i'm trying to say is the book is like pseudo autobiographic allegory atrocious however I do still think it's kind of useful though, because this book actually draws a really explicit parallel between his loss of faith and his current search for eternal life. To be told one's entire childhood that life is eternal, but you have to earn points if only you do this and that in the right order, and then told don't do this and don't do that or you'll lose points, and then to have that all stripped away from you one day is tough. Very tough. And then all those arcade ticket longevity points you earn for the afterlife to trade in for eternity with your loved ones, poof gone. It can mess with any mind. And look, I may not be a billionaire or anything, but you know what? In some ways, I kind of think I understand where Brian Johnson's coming from. Like grappling with the powerlessness of depression really can make you feel like you want to monitor and exert control over every single aspect of your life so that you never fall into those dark times again. Leaving a religion can leave a religion sized hole in your heart. And when you no longer have an instruction manual for achieving a higher purpose, you kind of still feel like you have to bow before something, even if you have no idea what it should be anymore. These themes of age reversal and changing your identity go way back with Brian, all the way back to that moment on Mount Kilimanjaro. Like, we already know what he did afterwards, but it's the way he fell afterwards that really ties this all together. I went home and I was changed. Um, I, sold, I, I sold my company shortly after Braintree. I got a divorce. I left my religion. And I was back 
at my 21 year old age and I said, who am I? Like what, how do I rewrite myself from scratch? What do I care about? What matters? What exists? What's true? What's not true? All of it. How did you rebuild yourself? Like what is that process of answering those questions? Everything I'm doing now is the answer. But the thing is, he wasn't back at his 21 year old age when this happened. He was 36 and he's not ever, ever going to get those 15 years back. But despite that, I do think that putting all this unresolved energy towards your physical well-being while presumably inspiring people to be healthier in the process is probably one of the better ways of dealing with all of this. Religious and depressive origins definitely explain a few quirks in the way he frames his self-improvement such as the all too familiar martyrdom or the excessive introspection and self-examination, but at its heart, I don't find most of what Brian's doing to be immediately harmful. It's just that the things I mentioned earlier that are harmful are extremely just over the top and they completely overshadow the good that he's doing. Like none of this changes the fact that he's effectively just substituted one obsession for another. Is obsession healthy just because health is your obsession? I really don't think popping 100 pills a day is worth it for any reason, whether it's in the name of science, the future, or some vaguely sacred higher purpose. But at the end of the day, the only person who knows where all of this is really stemming from from is Brian himself. Is he successfully creating an eternal life here on earth to make up for an afterlife he no longer believes in? Or is he just so scared of death that he's willingly giving up his life to feel like he has a say in stopping it? Regardless of the answer to any of this, I only know one thing for sure. Charging $75 for two bottles of olive oil is literal daylight robbery. Like what are the people in Ecuador going to do with that, Brian? I guess it's like the Bible says. You either die a Mormon or you live long enough to see yourself become olive oil Jesus. Anyway, thank you for watching. Thank you for the support if you happen to make it this far. And as always, I can't wait to see you in the next one. Bye. I left my mother's womb 45 years ago. I left my mother's womb 25 years ago and I'm still salty about it. I couldn't fit this in the video, but low key, Brian Johnson's kind of a fashion icon. Like I would dress like this at age 45. I almost want to hang out with this guy like just for a day but i feel like i would just wake up in a cryo chamber with half my blood missing wow